Next up, we have uh, Greta Rolanita from the Ministry of Finance on DORA, Digital Operation Resilience Act. Thank you. Right, thank you, Andrews, for inviting me. Uh, I won't be as entertaining as Martinez, uh, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. Right, so good afternoon to everyone. My name is Greta Rananita. I am a Chief Specialist at the Ministry of Finance. I am here today presenting DORA, Digital Operational Resilience Act, to you because uh, I represented Lithuania in the Council Working Groups, and I will be responsible for transposing some of its requirements into national law. So let's get into uh, deregulation. First of all, I would like to start with, with the reasons why we have DORA in the first place. So the first reason is uh, systemic vulnerability. So financial uh, entities currently are highly interconnected and rely, uh, often rely on their ICT systems. And therefore, it constitutes a systemic vulnerability because financial entities can become a channel for cyber incidents to spread across the whole EU financial sector. Another reason is the need for a harmonization. So, um, up to this point, uh, ICT requirements have been addressed in various different uh, legal acts, and DORA is here trying to constitute and make this uh, to set up the uniform and harmonized regime across the whole EU financial sector. Third reason is the need to manage ICT risks that, st uh, that stem from ICT third-party service provid providers. Uh, because of the absence of clear and bespoke union standards applying to the contractual arrangements between financial entities and ICT third-party service providers, um, there is this external source of risks that need to be managed at the EU level. And the fourth reason is the need for information sharing, but this is voluntary information sharing between financial uh, entities. As I mentioned before, there was, we have DORA because of the need to harmonize requirements, and it is done by involving a lot of different financial entities in DORA scope. So uh, I'm just go going to give you a minute to, to read it out. I have to know that the crypto asset service providers will also be included in 2025 when Mika comes into force, which is uh, market regulation on markets and crypto assets. And I have a question for you if, you, if you can just raise your hand, if you see yourself on the screen. Right, so I don't have my target group here, <laughs> okay, one, but, uh, but uh, I will continue so that there will be a lot of financial entities and DORA sets requirements for those said financial entities. So let's, let's go into the requirements. Uh, first of all, DORA lays down specific requirements for financial entities regarding ICT risk management. So in short, and with some exceptions for micro enterprises, uh, financial entities will be subject to a lot of things. So firstly, preparing internal governance and control framework and dedicating a human resource from senior management uh, responsible for overseeing that framework. Financial entities will have to put in place strategies, procedures, uh, and tools to protect mainly two things. So the first thing is uh, information assets and ICT assets, including computer service, uh, computer software, hardware, and servers. And the second thing to protect uh, is all relevant physical components and infrastructures such as premises, data centers, and sensitive designated areas. Uh, the, third, uh, the third component of ICT risk management framework is that financial entities on a continuous basis will have to identify and review all sources of ICT risks and cyber threats. Uh, cyber threats uh, come from NIST 2 directive from Cyber Security Act. Uh, and financial entities will have to have capabilities and the resources, meaning staff, to perform these tasks. So there will have to be trainings on a on, on, on yearly basis. Financial entities will have to monitor and control the functioning of ICT systems, as well as have in place mechanisms to promptly detect anomalous activities. So you will have to monitor all of the transactions and, and to um, look for, for anomalous activities. 
Uh, and also financial entities will have to have in place ICT business continuity policy to quickly react to those incidents and to uh, restore data and ensure that, that, that you have enough backup and recovery procedures that your business could uh, continue. And lastly, financial entities will have to inform their clients uh, if anything happens, especially if clients are affected. Two more things to note on ICT risk management framework is that, first of all, that more specific elements will, will be included in regulatory technical standards. So um, European supervisory authorities are currently preparing regulatory technical standards and uh, they, they, they will have it in place by the end of this year. And I will talk about them a little bit uh, later. Uh, but um, as this Lithuanian saying goes, wellness uh, lipid atalese. So, a lot of criteria always happens in those regulatory technical standards. So maybe when you read the regulation, you think that, oh, it's easy, the criteria, it's easy. But uh, when we have those standards in place, then, then we get to the details and, and what is applied to whom. Uh, and uh, the last thing on ICT risk management framework is that there will be simplified ICT risk management framework for some specific institutions, but as you, most of you are not financial entities, I'm not going to go into details on those uh, institutions that will have simplified uh, framework. Right, uh, nec next thing is ICT related incident management, classification and reporting. Uh, and according to Dora, financial entities will have to implement ICT related incident management process and record all ICT related incidents and significant cyber threats. So cyber threats may not be significant, you will have to record them only if they are significant. Financial entities will have to classify ICT related incidents and determine their impact based on specific criteria that will be in the regulatory technical standards that we do not have yet. Uh, and in case when you right, so you monitor incidents, then if, if incident uh, happens, you have to classify it. And if it is major based on the criteria, uh, then you then financial entities will have to report those major ICT related incidents to competent authority. In Lithuania, it's going to be mostly Bank of Lithuania. Uh, and then they will have to provide initial report in the immediate report and a final report on that uh, incident. And competent authorities will be subject to providing relevant feedback uh, when needed. In case of uh, ICT, major ICT related incident, and as I mentioned before, you will ha financial entities will have to uh, inform their clients uh, as well. <clears throat> also, some somewhat a new thing it's cyber threats so uh, financial entities uh, will have to classify cyber threats as i mentioned and on a voluntary basis inform competent authority about the cyber threat but uh, it, it's just on a voluntary basis there won't be a mandatory requirement on on informing about cyber threats uh, if you are a financial entity and you have had a major ICT related incident, you have practice, uh, there is a lot of reporting to be done currently also. And it, on, and it does not only happen in the national borders, right? The financial entity might provide the report to competent authority, but then there are a lot of other authorities that are interested in that report. So in DORA, there are a lot of arrangements how the reports will have to be transmitted. So it will be transmitted to European supervisory authorities and then to cybersecurity authorities. Those authorities will inform com co national competent authorities from other countries, etc. So it's the whole mechanism of how those reports are transferred. So in order to, to, to have it in place, uh, there will be a harmonization of reporting content and templates so that everyone would use the same template uh, of, 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 of uh, reporting. And also to make it easier, uh, Laura sets a requirement for European supervisory authorities to assess the feasibility of creating a single EU hub for major ICT related incident reporting so that everything would go into one single hub instead of just separate competent authorities. Next, final chapter, it's testing. 
So first, there are some uh, general requirements for financial test testing regarding uh, for financial entities regarding testing, and there are four of them. So first uh, is that financial entities will have to establish a sound and comprehensive digital operational resilience testing program. Second, uh, financial entities will have to conduct appropriate tests at least yearly, so quite often. Third, financial entities will have to ensure that tests are undertaken by independent parties, whether internal or external, it can be both. Uh, and financial entities will have to establish procedures and policies to prioritize, classify and remedy all issues revealed throughout testing. Now on the actual testing, so testing program shall provide execution of appropriate tests. Now please bear with me, it's quite a lot such as vulnerability assessments and scans, open source analysis, network security assessments, gap analysis, scenario-based tests, compatibility testing, performance testing, end-to-end -end testing, and penetration testing. As I said, quite a lot. Uh, micro enterprises shall perform this test based on risk-based approach. So not, 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 not everything, not at the, at the same time. Financial entities, with some ex uh, exceptions, will have to carry out at, uh, at least three years, um, carry out at least every three years advanced thread-led penetration testing, in short, TLPTs. Uh, national competent authorities will be able to decide whether that should be carried out more often or less often, not, not, on, not exactly three years apart. Uh, and TLPTs will have to cover several or all critical or important functions of a financial entity and will have to be performed on live production systems. So it can be, cannot be a testing system, it will have to be live production systems. Uh, ICT third party service providers will also be subject to testing. And of course, DORA set some requirements for the testers themselves, for example, some reputational requirements. <clears throat> Now, moving on, as I mentioned, a big part of DORA and one of the main reasons for to have DORA is to manage ICT third party risks. So one way to do that and what DORA does, it goes into contractual arrangements between financial entities and ICT third party service providers. Most of you might know them as outsourcing arrangements. We call them contractual arrangements in DORA. Um, so, uh, all of the rights and obligations of the financial entity and of ICT third party service provider will have to be clearly allocated and set out in writing and they will have to include all necessary requirements that are laid out in DORA. So if there are requirements that are set to financial entity or ICT third party service provider, everything will have to be in the contractual arrangement. If uh, And the full responsibility of compliance goes to financial entity. So if something changes or if something happens in the ICD third party service provider and financial entity is affected, financial entity will be responsible. For example, there is a possibility to outsource testing, but uh, financial entity was, will be responsible for its results. And next, next thing, so first is a, it's, it's uh, uh, requirements for contractual uh, arrangements. And the next thing is that Doris um, creates an oversight framework for critical ICT third party service provider. There will be a criteria laid out, laid out in regulatory technical standards. And based on that criteria, European supervisory authorities will make a decision whether uh, the ICT third party service provider is critical or not. And in case the provider is critical, then they will be super supervised by one of the SS. So there are three SS, EBA, ESMA, and EOPA, and then depending on the provider, it will be chosen which uh, SS will, will uh, over oversee that critical ICT third party provider. And the main tasks of that overseer of the uh, European Supervisory Authority will uh, consist of assessing whether each critical ICT third party service provider has in place effective rules, mechanisms uh, to, man uh, to manage the ICT risks and whether they follow them. Now, the lead overseer, or in other words, ESA, will have the power to issue recommendations for that, IC let, let's call it ICT TPP. So in short, ICT TPP, they will have the right to issue recommendations. Uh, if the ICT TPP does not follow those recommendations, uh, overseer will be able to issue penalties, daily penalties. 
but it might not work. Everyone understands that it might not work. Then the responsibility will fall on the financial entities. So if you are using the services of that of that set critical ICT TPP, uh, competent authority will inform the financial entity or you uh, about the recommendations and uh, and the actual requirements set in the recommendations uh, and the risks uh, that should be addressed and then financial entities will have to take specific steps to address those risks uh, stemming from ICT TPP. Um, and as a measure of last resort, competent authorities will have the right to require financial entity to suspend or terminate the contract with ICT TPP. Now lastly, so information sharing arrangements, as I mentioned before, uh, Dora uh, says that you can voluntarily share information regarding cyber threats, uh, but it has to happen in the market. So between among financial entities and the competent authority would not participate in those arrangements unless they are asked to participate, but it's voluntary and if financial entity decides to participate in such format, they will have to notify the competent authority. And the, the uh, competent authorities will have also supervisory, investigatory and sanctioning powers necessary to fulfill their duties. So three main powers. Firstly, access to any document or data relevant for competent authorities' performance of duties. Second, carrying uh, out on-site inspections or investigations. And third, requiring corrective or remedial measures and administrative pe penalties for breaches of regulation. So basically nothing new. All of this is, is a known information. Um, it's, it's just, uh, it might be just that the scope of DORA is bigger and it's a set up uh, mechanism for, for the whole uh, financial sector. Shortly about the timeline, so uh, regulation came into force this January, just uh, last week, uh, it was published. Uh, you, can, you can use the QR code if you're interested, the first one to, to, to read the whole regulation, to get familiar with it. Uh, the, but the second one, the second QR code, I believe it's a little bit more important right now. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of criteria will be set out in regulatory technical standards and European supervisory authorities just started to prepare these standards and they're going to have a technical uh, discussion with uh, financial entities on 6th February. Uh, anyone can join, any financial entity can join, uh, Just you, you just have to register so you can use the QR code uh, to go to their website and register for, for the uh, discussion. And DORA will be applied two years from now, so from January uh, 2025, so financial entities have two years to prepare. Yes, thank you. <laughs>